Discovering History Seminar online. We'll wait till 5.30 um, to officially start. Um, but I'm Ruth Ford, Senior Lecturer in the History Program at La Trobe University and based at um, the Bendigo campus. Um, usually we do community announcements at the start. Um, if anyone isn't on the email list and wants to be, if you can just email r.fordatlatrobe.edu.au and also just an announcement that this seminar is being recorded and live streamed by the Goldfields Library, which is available now or later on that link. Um, and um, it also means that if you don't want to be recorded when you ask a question, then you need to post your question to the chat rather than ask it live. And I'll talk more about that just before question time. Okay, well, it's 5.30, so we might um, make a start. So, um, welcome to the September Discovering History Seminar. These seminars are a collaboration between La Trobe University, Goldfields Library and the Bendigo Regional Archives Centre. Before I introduce the speaker, I'd like to acknowledge the Jaja Wurrung as the traditional custodians of the land we're on, recognise their ongoing connection to the land and acknowledge Jara elders past and present, as well as any Indigenous participants. The format for tonight is that the speaker will speak for 40 minutes and we'll have 20 minutes of questions and discussion. With the um, seminar, if you can just make sure you're muted and your video is off, except when you're asking a question, just to help with bandwidth. And during question time, you can either, you can utilize the raise your hand feature um, under participants if you wanna ask a question, um, or you can just raise your hand physically and I'll notice it, hopefully. You can also ask questions during the chat. Um, and just as I said, um, the session is being recorded and live streamed by the Goldfields Library. So if you don't want your voice and face recorded, then do post your question to the chat. Okay, so, whoops, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. Where's my slide for Charles? <laughs> so it now gives me um, very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Charles Fay, who's going to talk on housing the diggers Home and Housing on the Goldfields from 1857 to 1915. Charles is um, Emeritus Associate Professor in History at La Trobe University. And he's recently published with Richard Broom, Andrea Gaynor and Katie Holmes, Mallee Country, Land, People and History. And in 2019, the Victorian Historical Journal published his micro history of the Victoria Hill District. And with Amanda Jean, Charles has been researching housing in 19th century Bendigo. So I'm now going to hand over to Charles, who's going to share his PowerPoints. Mm -hmm. Fingers crossed, Charles. Did that work? Perfect. Good, thanks. Thanks, Ruth. I'm right to go, am I? Yep. You're right to go. Okay. Um, yeah, over the last couple of months with Amanda Jean, I've been um, looking at um, housing in Bendigo. And I suppose in particular, we've been looking at the miners' cottage. Um, I just want to introduce you to the biggest miners' co uh, cottage in Bendigo. Um, some of you might recognise this as, as Fortuna. Um, in 1871, George Lancel purchased Ballasted's house and his uh, business associate and I suppose uh, confident um, Isaac Dyson wrote in his, in his journal in March 1871 that uh, Lancel took me for a drive to see his purchase, fine engine and claim. Lancel does not take possession till May, met Ballasted, showed us all over the place, garden and house, fine place. 8,000 worth at least, fine piano, 250 pound, bottle of wine, all jolly. Now, Lancel and um, Dyson were to be intimately associated with Fortuna for the next 30 years. Um, 
three of uh, uh, Dyson's children were born in Fortuna when Dyson was in England after 1881. And when Lancel came back to Fortuna, uh, to Bendigo in 1888 or 1887, he went to live in Fortuna. And you mightn't think this is a miner's cottage, but it's interesting to note that um, when Lancel registered the birth, I think of his third son in 1887, he described himself as a miner, as a, as a miner on the birth certificate. And again, in 1879, during a, a, a miner's strike, he referred to himself in a, in a sort of rambling note that he sent to the miners as a miner from Uchum. But I think it's fair to say that this is not the typical miner's house. More typical is the house of Richard John Harvey, who was a, a working miner, a native of Eagle Hawk, and he married Emily Treganowen, who was also a native of Cornwall in August 1882. At this stage, John was 21 and Emily was 18. Both were the children of working miners. In 1873, Richard entered into a contract to purchase a house at, at Sir Just Point and it was, was worth 22 pounds. 10 pounds was to be paid uh, in two weeks and the remainder uh, within uh, three, th three months. Now, George Ellis in his uh, history of St Just Points suggests that this house was uh, constructed of uh, two rooms of weatherboard and uh, one of mud brick. When we first located in the Morong rate books, uh, it's described um, as being a wooden house. And at this stage, it had three residents and it was rated at a net annual value of eight pounds per annum. Um, I should note that Fortuna was rated at 420 pounds per annum about the same time, but that included sort of mining plant. Um, over the course of eight, 18 years, Emily gave birth to eight children, all of whom reached adulthood. To make space for his growing family, Richard extended this house sometime in the 1880s. In 1880, 1891, the house was rated at 15 pounds and contained eight res residents. Four years later, the house was still rated at 15 pounds. Um, and um, George, uh, Richard Harvey himself died like many miners of uh, what was known on his death certificate as fib fibrosis of the lungs, asphemia, which was undoubtedly um, a minor stasis. Um, in, the, in the 1960s and 1970s, historians began to look at the sort of the question of house, uh, housing in Australia in the 19th century. And I think the most important of these was the great economic historian, Noel Butlin. And Noel Butlin's great input into Australian history, I think, is to remind us that rather than being a nation of uh, country dwellers, most Australians, even in the 19th century, were city dwellers. And Butlin wanted to argue that a large part of the English money or the capital that was was generated in the 19th century, went into building cities and into building housing. Um, oh, shivers, someone's just rung me on the phone. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> um, but Butlin suggested that um, something like 50% of houses in Australia were, were owner occupied. He didn't have much evidence for that. Uh, but in the in the in the eighteen in the nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties, um, historians used rate books to look at home ownership and discovered that in the cities of Melbourne and Sydney, home ownership rates were lower than um, Butlin su suggested, uh, but they they were by international standards high. What we ask was the case in the gold fields. Um, in his great book the History, on the history of Ballarat, Weston Bates said uh, very little about, about housing. In a book of over 2,000 words, he gave one para paragraph to housing. But he does make some important statements about housing. Using rate books, Weston Bates argued that 
there was a trend over towards towards residential spe uh, specialization. He, he suggested around the lake, for example, there was a prized site for housing in, in Ballarat, but overall he argued that housing was very mixed in Ballarat. And moreover, he wanted to suggest that in the early years at Ballarat, home ownership was very high. Um, he suggested that this was high because of what was known as uh, what he called the miners' residence area. And he suggested that in the 1860s uh, and 1870s, um, something like 89% of miners owned their own homes, but this dropped to 53% uh, by the end, by, by 1890. Um, in this talk, I want to sort of say more about um, home ownership by looking at Bendigo. Um, and again, I think it's important to note that um, while Bendigo doesn't have many of the mansion styles, such as Fortuna, house ownership or house, house occupation in Bendigo was very much, I think, a product of uh, where you stood in the class situation in Bendigo. So in this talk, I want to talk about um, the factors leading to the, the, the quality of home ownership or housing in Bendigo. Um, Ruth, how do I get rid of the pictures at the side? It's blocking up my... Oh, anyway, I'll just, I'll just try and... Just use the arrow to change the slides. Yeah, but how do I get, I, I can't see my slides, so, because of the oh, pictures. Um, okay. <laughs> how did you change it before? Um, oh, yes, down here. Ah, give me a... You mouse over the thumbnail pictures at the top. Yeah. And there will come up a series of columns. And you want to go on to the shortest column. You can just drag it out of the way using the cursor. Oh, here we go. Oh. Ah, so I get going. Yeah. Can you get rid of it? Can you drag it further over? Oh, I'll, I'll just get. Yeah. Sorry about this. Ah. Oh, I don't know. I'll just have to push on. Sorry. I think you can drag. You can drag it. You drag it up to the top too. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll see how I go with that. Sorry about this. Hang on. Now, what have I done? Um, yeah, I, I can. Yeah, I'll get rid of that. Sorry about this. Okay, um, I'll just, I've, I've, I've blown a lot of my time, but I'll be, I better get on. Um, just to sort of give an overview of the, of the factors, I think, which affected housing uh, in Bendigo in the 19th century. Um, I, think it's an, I think it's important to note that most of the heritage houses that we have in Victoria, in Bendigo today, date from the mid 1860s to the early 1900s. The second point I think is important we should note is that although Bendigo uh, has some very grand civic buildings, and I think these buildings give a very false impression of uh, what life was like in Bendigo in the 19th century, Bendigo was largely a city of working class families. And, I, and again, when the early heritage studies were done in the 19, uh, 1990s, and um, this sort of, I, I think it was overlooked that this was a working class city. Now, I think it's also important to note that Bendigo was an instant city. Um, cheap weatherboard housing was required for a sudden growth of population between 1865 and 1875. And what makes this possible is government land policy, and I'll go into that as we go on. Now, I think a stable courts industry gave rise to ancillary industries, engineering works, consumer industries such as clothing and food trades, for example. Um, but 
gold um, was the major industry up until 1914, but the city also became a service centre for agriculture. And obviously that's what kept the city going in the years after gold. Okay, now in the early phases of mining, we, we mining is basically what was known as shallow alluvial mining uh, from the mid 1850s to the early to mid 1860s, puddling mining was introduced. Um, but and, and both of those forms of mining, I think, produced a rather ephemeral form of housing. Quartz reefing becomes the pr predominant form of mining after the mid 1850s. Now, I think when the city is first established, um, the government surveyors survey the centre of the city, Kangaroo Flat, Golden Square, White Hills, uh, and Kangaroo Flat. And these are all surveyed and, and sold at auction from the mid 1850s onwards. But alluvial mining distributed the population over a wider area and under the sort of miners right legislation of 1855, um, miners for, for the payment of a pound per, per, per year got the right to establish residences on Crown land. And if we look at the census of 1857, we can see that 80% um, of housing was one, room, was one room or a tent. And just to give you some sense of that, you can see in this slide, you can see in 1852, the center of the town, but alluvial mining, sorry, I've got, um, alluvial mining was spread well beyond that. In the next slide, you can see the, the areas that the government surveyed. So you've got White Hills surveyed, you've got the center of the city, you've got uh, Bendigo Flat, and you've uh, got um, Golden Square down here, and just outside the picture is Kangaroo Flat. Um, this is a map I've just recently found at the PRO site, and you can see it as early as 1856, the surveyors have um, actually sort of surveyed what's going to become the sit of the borough of Bendigo and the borough of Eagle Hawk in the, in the first instance. Okay, quartz reefing starts in the 1850s with individuals and partnerships, but from the late 1850s through to the late 1860s, there's a slow growth of, growth of company mining. And by the mid 1860s, there's an elite, an elite group of, of, of investors, George Lancel, John Boyd Watson, Joseph Bell, um, the, the Bell brothers, uh, sorry, the, the Hunter brothers. Um, but from 1869 through to 1872, there is a massive boom in the, in the flotation of quartz mines. And the center of mining in Bendigo moves into areas such as Ironbark, New Chum, which are just adjacent to the surveyed city. Bendigo's mining industry is highly unstable. Um, there are a series of booms and busts occurring throughout the 19th century. And by the uh, early 20th century, the center of more profitable mining had moved out to Eagle Hawk. Okay, now, the miners' right under the Mining Act of 1855 gave miners the right to dig for gold for one pound per year. It also gave them the right to build a residence on Crown land. And the provisions of this clause covered a large area that was considered auriferous, um, which, was, which the government was reluctant uh, to, to alienate. Much smaller area was offered for sale at competitive auction. And this competitive auction, I think, is very important because it locks the small man out of the sale of land. The Mines Act was revived in, 18, uh, revised, sorry, in 1865, and it continued the provisions of residence with a miner's right at a reduced rate of 10 shillings per annum. Um, and now, as well as the, the, the sort of miner's right, there is also business licenses, and these were a bit more expensive, or quite, quite a deal more expensive 
than the miners' right, but that gave businessmen the right to set up and build businesses on Crown land. Now, under the 1865 Land Act, um, there was provision for miners to freehold um, those parts of, of, the, of, the, of the public estate that they had put their houses on uh, if the government considered them that they weren't auriferous, but you had to do it by public auction. So again, um, only the sort of the wealthier mine owners could bid at those auctions and establish their houses. So a house like Fortuna, it becomes freeholded under those provisions. Okay, when we get into quartz reefing, miners settled into the hard work of, of cutting into the, the massive stone of Bendigo and much more durable housing was built. Um, and as, as the sort of um, quartz mining gets underway, miners make additions to their houses. So they make additions to their tents, but they begin to sort of build in local materials, bark, paling, stone, and mud brick, which was known, depending upon your prejudice, either as German or Egyptian brick. And you can see here that if we look at Eagle Hawk in 1865, um, even by 18, as late as 1865, a substantial proportion of the houses are, are still very basic. So, you know, something like um, almost 60% of housing is bush materials, canvas or huts, and you can, and you can see that uh, miners are living in this sort of basic accommodation. Um, I've got this wonderful description here by Maggie Hoey, who comes to Bendigo in 1860, 60, uh, 1856, and uh, she and her husband moved from Melbourne to Eagle Hawk, where they um, uh, try to um, uh, search for gold and they, 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 their mine is, is a, a mine known as the St Mungo Mine, which Maggie gave the name to. Maggie sort of talks about her tent and she says, the wind blows the same as yours, viz in torrents, and the thunder roars amongst the hills all round us, but we can bear them just as unmoved as if we were sheltered by the strongest wall of stone and lime. I had no idea that tents could be half so snug till now. Our floor is carpeted, a nice comfortable fireplace. No grate, of course. Such a commodity I've not seen since, since leaving Scotland, nor a fire of coals, always wood, table, chairs, chairs, everything like a house. But I think between the late 1860s and 1870, uh, 1873, there's rapid population growth into Bendigo and we get migration from other gold fields and overseas. Um, Ballarat, for example, in 1873 is in absolute and utter depression. So many miners move from Ballarat to Bendigo and we've got a continuous stream of miners coming from uh, uh, Cornwall to Bendigo. And the miners' right and the weatherboard cottage was the solution to housing these miners very quickly. And you can see that um, in 1866, something like 80% of miners in Bendigo, uh, this is only Bendigo, I haven't got the details for Eagle Hawk, lived on residence, uh, lived, lived on Crown, um, their housing on, 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 on miners' rights. And you can see that if you look at the business class, they're more often likely to be um, in freehold. So blue, um, um, sorry, so the businessmen are, are more likely, you can see they're more likely to have a freehold house. Okay, so the key to housing the miners was cheap weatherboard housing. And we've got this wonderful description from Richard, Richard Pope's diary, where he talks about building a house uh, out of St Just Point, just outside the border of Bendigo. And you can see from his diary entry that he puts this house up 
uh, between the 18th of January 1871 and moves into it by the 4th of February 1871. And the total cost of this house is um, less than um, 50 pounds, a very cheap house. And again, you can get some, some idea of the sorts of houses that Richard Pope and the migrants moving into Bendigo in the 1870s were living in. Um, this is a wonderful photograph. I've always loved this photograph. You can see a group of children playing on a muller keep. Um, and you, can get, you get a sense, I think, of just how basic living in Bendigo was in the 1870s. Another shot shows iron bark, I suppose, in the mid 1870s. I'll, I'll come back to this uh, later. In, in, in the talk. Again, I suppose the feature to be noted here is the, the sort of ubiquitous nature of the weatherboard house and um, the absolute lack of vegetation at this stage. And again, you can see here um, from the from the uh, assessment book of Bendigo in 1873. This is not a rate book. This is an assessment book, which is the book that the rate book was, was uh, compiled from. And you can see looking at one page uh, from Ironbark that all the owners, all the occupiers in this region are living on Crown land. And living on Crown land, they hold a miner's right. And this is very important. Okay, so the miners' right offered cheap housing but no security of tenure. The right had to be renewed each year and the miner could not let out his house if he left, left the district. Now, this becomes absolutely critical in the late 1870s when mining goes into one of its periodical downturns as they're trying to uh, discover a, a sort of new series of loads, gold, gold loads. And with a downturn in production, miners are thrown out of work. And it's in these years in late 1879 that guys like George Lancel try to reduce the wages of miners. And we have a, a rather large strike in 1879. So what the miners do is they lobby the, 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 the members of parliament to get security of tenure um, of, over their houses. And again, I think it's important to note that if you're going to win office, parliamentary office in Bendigo, you have to pay, pay, pay some, of, some observance of the demands of miners. And in 1881, a new bill is introduced which legislates a concept known as the miners' residence area. And this miners residence area basically allowed miners to have areas of um, safe and cheap housing. Um, under the first residence area act of 1881, um, occupiers of a miners right could take up a quarter of an acre as a residence area. And very importantly, they could hold two residence areas. But, they, but these couldn't be within 10 miles of each other. Now, the importance of this was it allowed miners to move around when unemployment occurred. Now, what you did with your, with your residence area is every year you took out your annual miners' right and you took your annual miners' right to the mines department, or sorry, to the lands, I think to the mines department, and on door endorsed on your miners right was the fact that you had uh, a residence area and from the 31st of March anybody holding a miners right for 12 months could have the privileges of this new act. If you were new to the act you had to erect a dwelling within four months and the right could be annulled if that dwelling was not occupied for three months. Now, after you'd occupied your residence area for 12 months, you had all the normal rights of landlord and tenant. You could let your, you could let your residence area out. 
And again, this is very important. If you're moving to a new mining field, you can let your residence area out and knowing it's not going to be taken by someone else. After uh, 12 months, you could sell the improvements on that residence area to your executives. Now, importantly, if land was deemed to be auriferous, um, the mines department could annul your residence area. Finally, um, under the 18, un under the Residence Area Act of 1881, you could apply to have your residence area uh, purchased by sale by auction. And the, the trouble with this is someone else could bid against you. Um, they would have to pay, if they, over, if they bid higher than you, they would have to pay for the improvements, but you would lose your house. So what happens um, over the next few years is that there are amendments to the Re Residence Area Act, which makes residence areas much more secure. So in 1884, um, there's a new residence area bill, and that increases the size of the residence area from a quarter acre to one acre. And again, this is very important because if you've got an acre, you can use your residence area for things other than just residence. And um, I've got this wonderful example of, uh, a, a, of a widow whose, whose husband is killed in a mining accident. She is able to use her residence area to set up a dairy and, and make a living from selling milk. What the 1884 Act also did is it gave you the exclusive right to purchase your block um, if there was no objection to it that the land was, was, uh, was, was, was auriferous. And what's more, that block would be valued by an approved appraiser. Now, this 1884 work act seemed to give more I suppose more security of tenure, but what the Devious Mind Act could do was simply refuse to endorse or, or, or to allow you to take out a miner's right and they could reclaim the land that way. So in 1892, a new act is introduced which stops the Mines Department from doing that. Um, in 1897, um, there's an amendment to the Mines Act, which reduces the miners' right from um, five shillings a year as it, as it was in 1881 to two and sixpence a year. So think about that. For two and sixpence, a very paltry sum, you could get an acre of land on the gold fields. And in 1910, um, a further amendment to the Residence Area Act allows the transfer of um, residence areas from husbands to widows without having to go through the process of getting a grant of probate. So basically what you can see is happening is that these, these revisions first from a miners right to a residence area is making for very cheap land on the gold fields. Okay, what I'll do with the remainder of the time is just show you some some important factors that, that come, at, come to play in the social geography of Bendigo um, because of these residence area acts. Um, this is an attempt I've made. The, 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 the 1891 assessment book is the first book, or, or, well, it is, unlike the rate book, gives us an indication that houses are on miners' residence areas. And you can see here that the miner's residence area is basically, as you'd expect, in the mining quarters of the city. So in Eagle Hawk, um, there's something like 440 residence areas. In Long Gully, um, 435 residence areas. And in Sandhurst South, another mining area, almost 400. But as we move into the center of the city, which, is, which I, as I said earlier, um, was, was surveyed and alienated by sale by auction, you can see that the number of residence areas drops dramatically. In a place like Golden Square, again, I noted before, um, 
that it was parts of it were surveyed in the 1850s and so there is um while there's a fair bit of mining in this area the number of residence areas is not as high as one would, would suspect and what this does is i think it sort of defines the social um, areas of bendigo so what i've done here is tried to map what's known as the net annual value of houses the net annual value is the is what a house um, would get if it was let out for a year. And you can see um, that basically um, the more expensive houses are in the center of the city. Um, the districts I've, I've got here um, are ones that I've worked out based on uh, voting areas from the first electoral roll of 1903. And you can see um, that the center of the city we've got the, the higher valued houses. And again, that is where the freehold land is. Um, and you can see the importance of this when we understand that in 1891, um, something like 60% of all miners in Bendigo and Eagle Hawk lived on residence areas. And again, the fantastic rate books at Eagle Hawk give us a description um, of the building materials used in houses. And you can see that the net annual value for a brick house in Eagle Hawk was, uh, this is the average, was about 33 pounds. But if you drop down to a weatherboard house, it's less than 14 pounds. Again, um, this is absolutely critical in making cheap housing for mining. And um, I just discovered before I was about to go on to this talk that missing from this chart is, is, is a group of workers, I suppose, skilled tradesmen. So we'll go to the next slide which, where I've tried to put it in. Um, now, what you can see here is that there is a clearly defined differential um, between the housing of miners and the housing of professional white collar people and the business people of Bendigo. Um, now, the skilled tradesman, a fitter and turner, a blacksmith, probably had a house valued at about 20 pounds per year. And a lot of that's to do with the fact that th they were working in the industries that were in the center of the town. That's where the great uh, engineering works were. That's where the the small artisanal shops were. So they are in a sense forced to live in those areas of, um, of, of freehold land. Um, you can see that when we get to professionals, um, the average value of their land is about 30 pounds, which is almost three times the value of a miner's house. Um, Labourers look to be the worst of all, but I should add that, um, this, the difference statistically is not significant, is not significantly different from minors. And again, when we look at women, um, female household holds, the rate books generally don't give occupations for women, but you can, but you can see that the, the average household value for women is over 20 pounds per annum. And I think the reason for that is that what we've got there is that female households um, you know, you know could, can range from George Lancel's widow in 1906 to a poor miner, miner's widow. So there is, it encompasses a range of housing types. Okay, I just want to finish by showing you a few pictures um, of what these houses look like. Um, this is a picture of a miner's cottage I took I suppose about 15 years ago uh, in Prout Street um, in Ironbark. And it's, it's my favorite house in Bendigo because it's actually got two front doors. Uh, unfortunately, this chimney is now gone. But if we look at a map of this house, so here we are in Prout Street. Um, the house I'm referring to is this house where I've got my cursor on and you can see this house looks down the hill towards the gully, towards the Ironbark Gully. And if you look carefully at it, you'll notice 
that it doesn't face the street. Uh, it, its original frontage looked down the hill. Um, when the streets are surveyed in the early 20th century, they changed the frontage of the house um, to uh, looking to being in Rhoda Street. And again, here's another of my favorite houses uh, showing no relationship to the street at all. Um, this is, can, can illustrate many of the facets of, of living in a miner's cottage. Um, this is a picture taken of a, of a miner's wife, Elizabeth Janes in 1882, and she's just given birth um, to a, a child here. Um, at this stage, she's already lost four children through infant deaths. And the sad fact is that within three years of this picture being taken, um, we can just wipe out three more children. Um, of her 10 children, only uh, three survived um, to adulthood. Um, this chap here um, became a minor himself and died in 1925 of minor Um Again, this is a wonderful example of a miner's cottage. Um, this is the house of Rhoda and Thomas Wern. And I think this picture was taken um, sometime in 1875. And we can see Rhoda with her first child and her husband. Um, um, a wonderful cottage. We can, we can get some sense of what it was like to live in these cottages when I show you the next slide. Um, Thomas was born in St. Just Cornwall, where so many miners came from in 1839. Um, Rhoda was born in Cornwall uh, in 1851. And I've been able to follow uh, Thomas through the rate books from 1873 to 1891, where he's a miner. They get married in Sandhurst in 1872, and seven children are born between 1873 and 1881. And of these children, uh, one died at age seven and one died as an infant. Okay, now if, if we can just get, flick back to that house, oops, sorry, back to that house, there's the cottage, okay. I think that's sometime in the 1870s. Now, if we think about living in this house, uh, in 1881, um, Thomas Warren, Warren is registered as living in a miners residence area, which is valued at 14 pounds per annum, and it has seven residents. Go back to the house, oops, too quick. Uh, we've got seven residents in that house. Going forward in 1891, the house hasn't changed much at all. Um, it's still rated at uh, 14 pounds and it has eight residents. So I think you can get this sense in which these families, large families are cramped in very small houses. Um, probably, again, probably no smaller than they would have had if they'd remained in England. But again, we've got to remember um, that they are the land, that they are largely without landlords. Okay, now this is a wonderful photograph um, that was taken um, in 1929. And we can see from this photograph what happens uh, after the Residence Area Act is introduced in 1881. And we can see with more security of tenure, uh, miners make additions to their houses. So we can see here this house has got three gables. It's got a veranda, another free gabled house there. Um, so with that security of tenure, miners make additions to their houses. Um, this is another example of a miners, residence, a, a miners residence area house, but it's the typical miners residence area, but built of brick. Um, the typical miners residence area um, was a gabled house, maybe rated at um, 12 pounds per annum. Um, for a person who was in a bit more comfortable position, such as a blacksmith, an engine driver, you could afford uh, rated at about 17 pounds per annum to buy a house with a hip roof. And basically what this hip roof house gave you, four basic rooms, sometimes with a skillion kitchen at the back, 
much more uh, spacious uh, than the sort of simple gabled house. Um, as you go up the social scale, you've got this house here, which is the, the house of a, a mine manager, John Jewell. Um, this is rated um, at 22 pounds per annum, and it has about six or seven rooms. Um, you can see what this mine manager is doing. Um, he's risen from being a simple, humble miner to a mine manager. And what he's done is he's risen in his social class. He's built this house, which um, I think shows his uh, neighbors who are miners that he has come up in the world. Um, he also had several houses that he let out to miners. And finally, um, when we get to that category of being able to afford over um, 30 pounds per annum, we get into the sort of the, the area of uh, brick and stone buildings. And again, this is a long gully example of a house um, built very much in the sort of, I suppose, the tradition that you'd see uh, from Cornwall stonework. Uh, in Cornwall, it might have been two stories, um, but in Victoria, in South Australia, it becomes a stone building um, of, um, of one story. And again, I suppose um, what we can see here is this more elaborate uh, decoration on the front. And again, I think the most important thing about all these houses is that they provide plenty of gardens for, in this case, growing flowers, but more importantly for the poor miners running chooks and growing veggies. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much, Charles. That was fantastic. So we'll now open it up for questions and you can either um, post a question in the chat or you can raise your hand or in via the participants button or you can do it um, via, you know, real things. So with first question, we've got a question from Mary. Do you want to unmute Mary? Can you? Hold on, I'll do it. Unmute. Charles, yeah. I'd just like to ask, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Mary. Um, is there any systematic process for preserving these miners' cottages? Because over the time I've lived in Bendigo, which is quite a few years now, there have been lots of things that have been lost. You know, beautiful little cottages. You drive past one day, they're there. The next day, there's a concrete slab on it. So is there any process by which, are they under any kind of um, overlay so that they're um, not just summarily knocked a lot, down? A, a lot of them, um, I'll, I'll give you a bit of history, Mary. Um, when, when the architects did the heritage survey in the 1990s, um, they, they had no interest in these weatherboard houses. And the thing about them is because the miners' residence area is on alluvial land, they are scattered all around the city. And you can't see in Bendigo nice streetscapes like you yeah. can in Carlton or Fitzroy. So the architects totally neglected them. And so what um, Mandy, Jean and myself have trying, been trying to do is we're trying to get the council, I suppose, to do what's called a serial listing of these houses. So um, even if they're outside heritage areas, um, they will be given protection. But at the moment, a lot of them have no protection. Um, and, they are and, so, so iconic of the era. Well, they are, they are the scent, I mean, they are the heart of Bendigo, you know, yeah. the heart of the Victorian gold. And the heart of our heritage, really. Yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. Just, Thanks, as important, just as important, I would say, as Fortuna. Thanks, or, <laughs> Thanks Mary. Other questions for Charles? Okay, while you're thinking of your questions, I'll ask one. Charles, um, I loved in your presentation all the stuff about um, women and, um, you know, the description from Maggie Hoey was, was amazing. Can you talk more about um, what your research has shown about um, women's women's place in housing and households and how that challenges kind of the image of, you know, the gold fields as a male place? Um, yeah. Um, 
in, in, in the initial phase, um, women don't appear um, as the rateable persons on the on the on the rate book, okay? And and that's basically because of the miners resident miners right, you had to be a miner. Um, but I mean, you think um, of the difficulties of running a household uh, in in one of those houses. Um, in the your husband might be working um, as a shift worker, so you'd have the problem of feeding your kids, keep, keeping them clean. Um, in those areas, there would be constant dust coming into the house, um, constant uh, smoke and fumes from battery works, and um, so 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 the miner's wife is absolutely critical in keeping that that family together. Um, now. The, the other important thing I think to bear in mind is that mining is such a dangerous occupation um, that people are constantly being injured and killed in mines. But more importantly, um, the mines are basically killing the husbands. So what happens over a period of time is that by the 1890s, the early 20th century, um, the, 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 the sort of the rate payer is no longer the miner, but it's the, it's it's the widow of the miner. So we, we see a, we see a greater um, pre predominance of um, uh, miners as ratepayers. Um, I think one of the great problems for women in mining communities, particularly in Bendigo, um, is there are very little in the way of employment opportunities for women. Um, unlike Melbourne. There isn't the um, clothing workshops. There isn't the department stores. Um, so, 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 so women um, are basically um, locked out of locked out of the labour market to a large extent. But um, they they come into their own, I think, when you have to um, make do uh, with other forms of income. So um, you can we can see we can see women. Uh, using their houses as, as shops, as um, um, as I said before, using them as dairies to provide sort of extra income for their families. So I don't know if that answers your question, Ruth, is it? No, that's great. Okay, we've got a question from um, Portia or Jack. I'm not sure which one. <laughs> hey, Jack. Charles. How are you going? Uh, yeah, I've got a question I'm going about... better than the bombers. <laughs> Come on. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've got a question. I was wondering, what did the business elite and the mine owners think about the miners getting security of tenure? tenure? Like, did they want an itinerant workforce or what was their view of the whole political situation? Um, I, I, I think um, initially, um, I mean, for, for them, what, what, the, what the miners' residence area does, I think, is... Um, it, it produces, I think, what the economists call a monosopic workforce. Um, and, and basically, um, there is nowhere else you can go for much for employment, um, but you've got this security of tenure. And I think that enables the mine owners um, to have this expendable workforce. Um, you can lay miners off when when the um, yields go down, um, when the yields go down, all the mine, all the mine owners to hold on to their mines had to enter in what, into what were called uh, labour covenants. They had to agree to employ a certain number of men. Now, one way of doing that was to employ the miners on a system of employment known as tributing. And as a tributer, you basically worked for yourself but paid a proportion of the gold that you got back to the mine owner. And so what I, what I, what I think the, the, the residence area does is it perpetuates a, 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 very, ex, um, a very exploitative system of, of employment. Uh, it, it enables a very insecure system of employment to survive for far too long. Um, I mean, I think... Um, um, Keynes once sort of said, uh, you know, the world would have been better if um, um, we put. Oh, anyway, I mean, <laughs> this. I mean, gold. What gold serves no other purpose in the 19th century but being the gold standard. 
Um, and and I, I, I personally believe that um, mining continues in Bendigo um, for, a, for, a, for a long period with miners getting very small wages, um, being having highly insecure work, and they're able to do that simply, I think, because of the residence area. It enables them to live uh, rent-free almost. It enables them to subsist. Um, they can sort of uh, have their veggie patches. They can have uh, chickens and the like in their gardens. Um, again, if you if you if you ever look at the memoirs of um, um, the clothing manufacturer, um, I've forgotten his name at the moment. Gee, I'm getting getting forgetful in my old age, but he he talks about when his father was unemployed. Um, every every morning, um, something would be left out on the veranda for, for them to 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 eat from uh, a chicken or some veggies or something like that. So so what 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 I think is although the residence area gives them the sense of home ownership, it enables a very insecure form of employment uh, to continue for far too long. Um, they would have been better off packing up most of them and heading off to Melbourne in the 1880s and 18, well, early 20th century, which they did, you know, to many, in many ways. Does that answer your question, Jack? That, that does, that's not what I expected, thanks. Any other questions for Charles? Uh, yes, I've, I've got a question. After oh, why after... Georgina first, and yeah. then from Jan after that. Um, I've been looking at some miners' rights maps, from Molden. Okay. And in really poor condition. Hang on, I've looked. They've been heavily referenced, and I just wondered why they were so heavily referenced. Ah, okay. Um... I mean, have, having been an employee of the lands department many years ago, the maps, maps basically are, you, 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 maps are working documents. So um, what you, what the, um, the mines department and the lands department would do is they'd make a parish plan and then that would become their working document. And on that parish plan, they would write that uh, Joe Bloggs um, was the occupier of a block, um, <clears throat> were, you know, and then when he sells it, they'd rub that out or they'd put a, a, a line through that and add someone else's name to it. Then periodically, as those maps became clogged with information, um, they would send them off, they, would, they re would redraw them, send them off to the printer and... Uh, get a new parish plan, and they would then work on that parish plan again. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Like so, I'm looking at them, thinking maybe twenty year intervals. Um, I, I've, I've never. I mean, I've I've seen this with uh, land selection files, but I've never had access to mining no. areas to sort of know. The land part, lands maps, but then overlaid by I think Molden Shire. Oh, okay. Coloured in with. Um, tailing leases, miners' rights, um, you know, yeah. obviously different amounts of rate paying. Yeah, well, that's, again, that would be the council using those parish plans that are made by the lands department. Yeah. Again, as I say, you, you've probably got them because they've thrown them out and annotated another set of maps. Mm. A question from Jan? Uh, yes. Um, I uh, was wondering what the comparison was to other goldfield towns and cities like Ballarat and Castlemaine, whether the miners had the right for uh, buying their miners' rights to, to land and to build houses. Um, certainly, the, the, uh, I know a little about um, Castlemaine only briefly, uh, that the first uh, land sales were bought up by speculators and the miners and the poorer people were pushed to the outskirts into tent towns but after that I have no idea what happened would be it's exactly the same um, the, the the miners right applies to all areas that okay. the government considered was auriferous um, and um, I suppose once I mean one of the great debates uh, in the in the 19th century is the mining on 
on freehold land. So to avoid that sort of controversy, the Mines Department simply um, kept uh, large areas designated as auriferous. So the, the system I've talked about in Bendigo applies to all the gold fields. Okay. And, and, and it, it creates, I mean, it, it, as I was saying to, uh, to Jack before, uh, it creates a system of um, pre-welfare state welfare, I think. It holds um, population, surely. <laughs> you keep those towns populated. It wouldn't yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, I mean, the, these, these sort of clauses apply all over the, over the colony and in the state. And, if, and if, you, if you go through probate records in the early 20th century, um, you'll see you know, a huge number of people uh, occupying sort of bush blocks, um, clinging onto crown land. It's, it's, it's very important in, in, in dealing with welfare, I think. And just a similar um, question, Charles, in the chat. So was the impact of the, um, of the Residence Act similar in other Victorian goldfields? Yeah, exactly the same. Yeah, it, it, the, the law applies to, to all the gold fields. Um, then Bendigo is simply the biggest case, I think, you know. Um, oh. Sorry, uh, I was going to add a little bit to my question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did, did Bendigo have the largest um, or the, the greatest amount of, of the industry when it became um, capitalised? Uh, with the uh, quartz mining and so on than, um, say, Castle Main or... Yeah, um, I mean, um, I mean, my old PhD supervisor, Graham Davison, used to always say of Castle Main that um, the Victorian railways was emptied into Castle Main because um, the local member for the, the local member was often minister for railways. So um, in Castle Main, you get um, you get the Thompsons engineering works. Um, Bendigo um, really suffers from not having a great deal of in, industrial development uh, in the 1880s and 1890s. So um, there's only small scale, um, you know, artisan but butchers, bakers and things like that. There are a few large engineering works, um, but not as big as say it, um, mold and not as big as Thompson's or not as big as um, um, what's it the, the um, rolling stock work no the um, the one at Ballarat I can't think of its name but again um, if, if, if you if you rely on um, those sorts of endeavors you have to rely on being employed uh, getting gov government contracts um, just as a just in in, in just to, as an, a way of um, putting Bendigo in context, I, I mean, I suspect um, that in the 1880s, the largest concentration... I just, I just had it wrong. Hmm? A cup of tea in St. Panadol would be nice. Oh, just... <laughs> Turn the mic off. Um, Charles, just another question from the chat. Yeah. Did miners working the deep lead mines have a miners' right and therefore have access to the Residence Act, or did you need to have your own mining claim? No, you, you, you didn't. Um, you didn't need to have a mining claim, but you needed to um, get what was known as a miners' residence, mine, miners' right, and you had to then take that miners' right to the Lands Department and they would give you a miners residence area. So, um, and, and, and before, before the Residence Area Act is introduced, miners, miners rights are, are, are peppered all around the gold fields. So, um, you know, you might, you might have an area set aside for the lease of, of the large mine, but on the edges of that mine would be crown land, which, which people would hold on miners residence Miners' rights and then miners' residence areas. So you didn't actually have to have a, you didn't have to actually have a, a, a working claim. Again, does that answer the question? You've... 
Yes, thanks, Charles. Well, I'm aware that it's um, over time and many of you will be wanting to have your dinner. So if you could join with me in thanking Charles for a fantastic talk. And next month, um, we'll have Elizabeth Offer, a postgraduate from La Trobe, who will talk about Dressed and Blessed, Brit Neela, Dress and Goldfield's Jewish Families. So thank you very much for coming. If you want to be added to the email list and you're not on it already, just email r.ford at latrobe.edu.au. Take care, stay safe, and fingers mm. crossed that we get some small respite from the stage three and four um, lockdown restrictions on Sunday. Um, and look forward to seeing you next month.